Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, Authors at Google New York, our special Valentine's Day poetry workshop. What we're going to do today is we have four fine poets from Four Way Books who will uh, give readings of their current work. And then they will provide prompts for you to take home a poem to someone you love today. Make it, change it up a little bit from what is expected. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Victoria Lynn McCoy. She works with Four Way Books and has been integral in bringing poetry to Google New York office. And she will introduce uh, the first poet. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, and to Google for having us back. And thank you, all of you, for being here. Um, I, my name is Victoria McCoy. I'm assistant editor and publicist for Four Way Books. We are a nonprofit literary press based out in Tribeca. Um, we publish 11 to 13 books of poetry and short fiction each year. Um, and we are really excited to have this ongoing partnership with Google to bring poetry to you guys. Um, so I'll just get started. Our first reader is Alex Dimitrov, who was born in Sofia, Bulgaria. He is the recipient of the 2011 Stanley Kunitz Prize from the American Poetry Review. Um, he is the founder of Wild Boys, a queer poetry salon in New York City, works at the Academy of American Poets, teaches creative writing at Rutgers University, and frequently writes for Poets and Writers magazine. Dimitrov is the author of American Boys, a neat chat book from Floating Wolf Quarterly, and his new book, Begging For It, is just out from Four Way Books. He received his MFA in poetry from Sarah Lawrence College, and he lives in Manhattan. Please welcome Alex Dimitrov. Hi. Um, so um, I'm going to read some poems, um, thinking maybe three or four. Um, and my writing prompt actually is on a piece of paper. Um, it's questions, so I guess I'll read them, but um, I'll, pass, I'll pass it down. Um, so, um, is everyone excited that it's Valentine's Day? Yes. How do you feel about Valentine's Day? I have complicated feelings about it. Um, OK. Um, this, uh, this first poem is called, um, This is a Personal Poem. My self-self is thinking about itself, trying to sell itself a new self. Don't worry, reader. I'm not trying to fool you with language. I have eyes to do that with. I have forgotten our history. I have forgotten how we met. Reader, are you upset at how fast we're moving? I'm likely with you in your bed, between your hands, somewhere in your mouth before whatever it is you'll say next. Say yes and now and love too. Say, what did Judith Butler say when saying, one is undone in the face of the other, by the touch, by the scent, by the feel, by the prospect of the touch, by the memory of the feel. I want to know you, reader. I want to know a lot of things. Can we ever truly forget about ourselves? Is every self a self that makes itself available to love? Like death and its kind availability. Like language, reader, would we still be so unhappy if we could escape it? To name the namelessness that is love in what we read and what we see and what are feelings really, facts or flaws? Or something tells me now that I must leave you, reader. It's not you, it's me. We guess at why things end. We ruin things. We start and stall. And all, all, all we do is want. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of a poem about love, but not really. I was thinking what um, love poems to read from this book, because it's all love poems, actually. Um, they're just very different love poems. Some are to my father, some are to um, people that I've been with, um, some are to um, women that I love. Um, how about... This one's called Uncomplicated Happiness. 
maybe I don't want uncomplicated happiness. In the morning, one of us turns to dress away from the other, although little has changed. In a better world, memory would always lead back to affection. Who is that person on the edge of the bed looking back? Nothing is uncomplicated, traveler. Maybe I wanted you to stay for the wrong reasons. Maybe it's the wrong reasons I love. I too am somewhere over an ocean, writing you this as fast as I can. Then I'll read one that's kind of, um, I don't know, really about love, or apparently about love. <laughs> Sensualism. Sensualism is not a word. It's a word that Susan Sontag used in one of her journal entries. Um, and I loved, um, I loved its use, um, and I love her. So um, this poem's kind of, kind of thinking about um, that word and what it is, um, and a lot of other stuff. While lying in bed, I think about sensualism. A mosquito presses into my skin with such cruelty I mistake it for love. The stranger above my window decides to jump and doesn't. Where was I? I was opening the door to your life and mine. We have some words for each other, and then what? We have some nights in a city next to an ocean filled with more longing than we can describe. I want to place your hand close to the knife and let it sit there. I want more than the cut or how we'll gently spill out. The mosquito will drink for as long as I'll let it. And I do. I hold still, waiting for you. The vein rises. It is this flood of living that comes. Now I'll read one more, and then I'll do the prompt. Um, this one's called The Composer's Lover. We had an hour without music a nerve brightly turning in a closed room of the mind, the heart's black pool, a word that expired into the air and woke everything. Your bed slid under an invisible knife. What happened to us after meeting when the right note claimed Manhattan's May morning like an elegy already moving through the living? Today, we are among them, here to unsettle each other, to undress beside the piano, elegant and unmistakably his. Once it has you, there is a mouth that never releases, a faint circle in a field of rust hanging on the wall. We are not there. We are in our bodies, like teeth marks in a shirt you once saw falling off him, the delicate taste of blood that passed between us before lust before anyone could forgive us. Um, <clears throat> so um, I did this project over the summer called um, uh, Portraits of 13 um, People I Don't Know from the Internet. And what it was, was um, this um, questionnaire that I posted on my Tumblr. Um, and people could come, and if they uh, wanted to um, engage with it, they could answer the questions, but they had to email me back. Um, so. Um, I sort of tailored it to be more about love, since it's Valentine's Day. Um, so I'm going to just pass this out, um, or just give it to you. Um, so it's nine questions and one command. This is called Love Poem, Nine Questions, One Command. Um, so I'll just read the questions. And um, I also put my email on there if you guys want to email me your responses, um, if you feel like it. Um, so it's called Love Poem. What was the happiest time in your life? Do you think you'll ever be happier? What wouldn't you do for love? What do you want most while you're here? What do you want that a poem can't give you? What is the dish you always order at your favorite restaurant? Do you have a sweater that hugs you just right? Who is the first person you thought of this morning? 
who is the last person you thought of before bed last night? And the command is, write a 10-line love poem of questions like this one for one of those people. So um, if you guys feel like it, um, you can do it. And if you feel like it, you can also send it to me. Um, so thank you. Thanks for listening. Our next reader will be Paul Lisicki, who is the author of Lawn Boy, Famous Builder, The Burning House, and most recently, Unbuilt Projects from Four Way Books. A graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop, he's the recipient of awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, the James Michener Copernicus Society, and the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. He's currently the New Voices Professor in the MFA program at Rutgers Camden. Please welcome Paul Lisicki. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to be here. And uh, I'm excited about reading for you. I'm going to read some pieces that I don't usually read um, from this book. What, what's happened in the past few months since this book has been out is that I get notes from people who identify the pieces that the favorites seem to be the pieces that I don't pick. So I'm going to, I'm going to, this is for all the people who, who like pieces that I, um, have neglected, I think. So um, the first is called The Physics of the Known World. It's very short. This book has a foot in poetry, it has a foot in fiction, and it has a foot in the lyric essay. It really wants to live in the cracks between genres. So this one is rather short. It's all of a paragraph. And I think of it as um, a theory of love, one of my theories of love, The Physics of the Known World. That silly retriever. He doesn't go to the two guys looking right at him, beaming him awake with concentrated joy. Not at all. He goes straight to the man with his head turned to the left, who could care less about doggy behavior and isn't the least bit stirred by the snout parked in the knee and the wagging hind parts. And that's it, the physics of the known world, which is why the trees look better when they're left unwatered and the birds actually prefer it when you don't sing back to them. And the holy man crossing the street with the black brim hat, he knows better than to pick up what he's dropped and lip, lift his face to the mountains. Take it from him, friend. You probably wouldn't even want it if the light hit you in your head. The next piece is a bit longer, uh, a bit of a narrative. Um, this is about. Uh, life and death experience I had with my ex. And my ex wrote a version of this, a very well-known poem in which I appeared. And I happened to be in an audience with him next to the poet Brenda Hillman, who turned to me halfway through the, through the reading and said, Paul, you write your version of that. So this is, this is my um, version of Mark's version of this story. And it's called In the Li Unlikely Event. I don't know why I never read this. That's, there's something to be unpacked in that. When I watched her teaching us the fundamentals of emergency crash position, I thought, this woman likes her movies too much. How else to account for the way she smiled through her tears? Why turn her back on us and sob into her fist? I looked over my shoulder. Were we sure this wasn't being filmed? Alan Funt, where on the plane was Alan Funt? <laughs> Nevertheless, I behaved as I was supposed to behave. I tried not to fuss. I tried not to make too much of the coiffed businesswoman to our left who reached into the seat pocket in front of her and with refinement and discretion put her air sickness bag to good use. Surely, we'd laugh and clap and laugh at the whole damn thing. And it was only when Mark took my hand, the way others around us took their neighbor's hands, that I felt the surge of heartbreak, adrenaline, and embarrassment that lets us know we're not asleep. How then, in the time that followed, did I become someone I didn't know? It wasn't wisdom. I had as much wisdom in my head as there were pain pills in my back pocket which meant none, and it certainly wasn't cool. Even strapped in my seat and chastened, I felt my left hand tapping out a warning code. Maybe some of it had to do with the years I wouldn't get to live out with Mark, the fun we'd miss, our house, our dogs. Who would watch over our dogs? At least the two of us would go down at once if that was any kind of comfort. 
But what did comfort mean when Mark looked so unguarded and hurt, as if he were determined to take it personally and couldn't foresee that he'd one day get a poem out of the experience? And here's where another stepped in. I wouldn't have believed it either if you'd told me that my mother leapt up from her house in Florida like some superhero ready to save the day. But there she was, standing at her sink, running hot water over a jar she couldn't open. And when I thought of her getting that phone call the next morning, just as she wrenched off the lid, I numbed. Not because she loved me better than anyone or because I remotely approximated the son she'd wanted me to be, but because she'd had enough for one life. And the thought of making her suffer, guilt, even in my last minutes above earth, was not something I could take on right now. So my two legs pushed into the floor as if it were possible to pilot the plane myself, even as the damn thing wobbled and swung and the silos of the Midwest looked nearer and nearer. That's when I went through the window, the tiny square window to my right. Pinned to my seat, squeezing Mark's hand, I thought myself into that sky, taking myself out of the body that was sure to be pummeled and burnt. I was aware of my ability to influence and not, and there was a calm to the procedure, like what it must feel like to be an addict on a good day when you push your blood back and forth through the works. Was that why the treetops beneath us were greener than mangrove, or why I could so readily think of each person who mattered and put a hand on each forehead and each face as if I'd always been faithful to the God I prayed to as a child but hadn't known that till now. I thought some of the light into the head of each person on the plane, to Mark, to the flight attendant, even to the pilot, who must have been doing the best he could with the creature that was trying and failing to hold us aloft, not to mention my mother. Maybe that's why we landed as smoothly as we did, or I'm kidding myself, because just when it was clear that we were out of harm's way, though I'm not telling you the whole story, I'm leaving out firemen and ambulances and a line of tornadoes too obscene to talk about, I felt something like rage as we waited to be transported by bus by members of the National Guard. Rage to be back in a body after the high of being out of it, rage to realize I'd never outsmart death, though a part of me had tricked myself into thinking I'd pass some test. And, and, and I'm gonna close with a short piece called Two Guys. Do any of you guys remember a discount store called Two Guys? Very, it's very far from, from the world of Google 2013. But um, it, it becomes, it's, it's, you know, I guess it was a precursor to Target and the discount stores we know today. And that's sort of the figure around which this piece revolves. I think that's all you got to know. Two guys. When you lost what you remembered, New Jersey became as tired as they said it was. And childhood sprang traps ready to bite into the skin of our ankles. Will we get it back? Maybe it's a relief that we've left it behind and we can both give thanks for this bout of forgetfulness. I never really missed two guys as much as I missed you. The automatic doors, the trading stamps, the blinding interior, monstrous as a spaceship. You deserve better than nostalgia. There's always more to give our lives to, even if we thought we'd landed at the end of the world. May the stores be better where you are. May you not waste a single second thinking about what you should or shouldn't buy. And if you should hear a boy calling for his mother by the record department, walk on. He's doing much better than you think, really. He owes you that. The songs are blue and glistening, even if he has a hard time making sense of them from here. So thank you. Um, my prompt, my prompt. Um, Write about an object while you think the word goodbye without using the word goodbye in the piece. I'll say it again. Write about an object and think about the word goodbye without using the word goodbye in the piece. And 
that is it. Thanks very much. Victoria Raydell is the author of three books of poetry and three books of fiction, most recently Woman Without Umbrella from Four Way Books. Her novel, Lover Boy, was awarded the 2001 S. Mariella Gable no Novel Award and the 2002 Forward Silver Literary Fiction Prize, chosen in 2001 as a Los Angeles Times Best Book and adapted for a feature film directed by Kevin Bacon. Riddell is a professor at Sarah Lawrence College and has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Fine Arts Work Center. Please welcome Victoria Riddell. I should be running a board meeting. That's what I was thinking. Um, like Alex, I feel like most of my book is some version of a love poem or the end of love. So um, I'm going to read uh, four poems. And this first one is a poem called Upgrade. I don't want to say it didn't fit, never worked, or worked at first, then in fits and starts. The switch is useless, gears stripped. No, I don't want customer service, a claims department, complaint letters, an exchange or credit towards the latest model, an upgrade or lifetime parts replacement. Even now, broken, chipped in pieces, pieces lost, worn out, the original gone. There are times still it comes back to me whole, and I am amazed by what is beyond fragile, by how elaborately and generously wrecked and beyond repair we made use of our hearts all those years. And then. So this poem sort of, it, in, I guess in a certain way, is a valentine, this next one. Um, I think of a valentine as being uh, some kind of direct address to someone, you know, um, some little heart you're giving in some version of it. Today we're this world's darling. All the trees on Broadway thrill white petals. Different time of year than Valentine's Day. All the trees on Broadway thrill white petals. Daffodils gather in bouquets to fling themselves at us like schoolgirls. Shopkeepers lean from doors, tip hats, toss candy and fish. Sidewalks sparkle up to catch our eye. Holy moly, even the incorrigible past has arrived, pledging it will finally learn goodness and mercy. Don't look up. Don't wave back or wink. Hurry off the avenue and bolt the door. By tomorrow, snickering, show off, fake. They'll croon for Lindsay or Nick's black eye. The publicist of someone's rehabbed heart rumors, maples will turn gold for his comeback. Ovid can tell you, give it 15 minutes, and if you're lucky, you're banished to an island. Or like Poe, your obit written by the enemy Griswold declares in print, few will grieve. There's Bessie Smith in her unmarked grave. Let biographers flock to the clever and pretty, declare us old drab utterly last season. And when they're gone chasing the next fabulous story, say again just one of those things I can't repeat here, those gorgeous, scandalous, tender words you say to me each morning that would make them quiver, that would change their lives. So this next one I'm going to read. Um, I've only ever read out loud once before, and it's a poem called Kissing. Um, and uh, how I came to write it was um, that I had received an invitation to be part of an anthology, which was an anthology called Dirty Words. And uh, each of the writers were could choose a dirty word and write a piece about it, a poem, a story, an essay, whatever they wanted. I received my list of dirty words, and um, they were really pretty dirty words. And uh, I kind of looked at it, and I thought, oh, I'll choose later. And I freaked out and put it away, and then didn't um, deal with it for a while. And then they um, came back, and they said, well, they're, it's great. Everyone's chosen words. There are two words left. And one word was condom, and the other word was um, a dirty Pierre. I didn't know what dirty Pierre was. Oh, look, someone knew what it is. I had no clue what it was, so I thought, well, I'm really out of this anthology. But I looked and looked at the list, and I realized that nobody, that the word kissing 
wasn't on the list of dirty words. So um, I decided to try to write a poem called Kissing and uh, try to look at it as seriously as I could. Kissing. The first surprise of your mouth and mine. On streets, on staircases, in bathrooms, in the backs of cabs, in a field against that wall and that wall and that wall, down on the floor, my hair caught in it, in hotel beds, in a borrowed bed, and in the same bed night after night after year after night, through an open window, under pines, underwater, on a raft, in rain, salty with ocean, a peck at the door, a have a good day. Our mouths, prepositional. Eyes open, eyes closed, your face in transport, combustible. At the sink doing dishes and suddenly you are turning me saying give me your mouth and I am giving you my mouth. Coming up out of it stunned. Like there is another room inside and then another room. Strawberries, sourness of coffee, a slight fizzy sweetness or the clean grass taste as only you taste. Your face so close to mine. A fluency accented, each vowel and consonant exactly formed. Sudden native speakers. Morning, just wakened, still, slow, and thick, and dreaming, turning away from your reach. Kissing like nobody's business, like something windy, like good weather. In winter, our mouths the warmest place in the city. A lower lip flecked by teeth pulling back just a little to breathe together. Snuck, stolen, last, first, unbidden, forbidden, sloppy, delicious, French, farewell, slippery, criminal. A private syntax. Pun and slang, slip of tongue, intentional. Could I have known on the Harwood Building stairwell with my first fast, dry, 12-year-old kiss that I'd become a woman who'd drive across state lines for the moment just before the kiss begins? What I miss is the makeout. That's what I'd go for if I had a night on the lamb, the married woman says, looking at a couple who have rolled off their picnic blanket. One of us might say, only this. And then it's the first night all over again, tumble and wrestle, every mystical, dirty, delicious thing two mouths manage. Kiss me goodbye, you say, and on a street among strangers in floppy hats and winter coats, we slip into one another to say last apologies and promises. In a bank line or sitting at a table with friends, I touch my mouth. I am drifting or you are drifting, and one pressed against the other whispers good night. The last one, the day's punctuation. And this is the last one. And then. What if, darling, tonight we tell only the best stories we have of other loves? Not just nights of pleasure, but the way he laughed from the back of his throat, the truthful things she said that made you cry. What about that spring wind, and when there was a bicycle, a downpour, and someone had or didn't have a poncho? Someone said the very thing you longed to hear. You told a secret and were safe. She had a fever. He lost a father. There were good meals. To think of those fine shoes we scuffed about in thinking we were royalty. And remember that plastic tiara and the clumsy pavan? Remember what you wished and how he wished too. Look at us now, drink coffee, talk about the day's particulars and possibilities. Morning light folds across the wood table. Could we bear to look at one another without, could we bear to look at one another knowing how full the heart has already been? How we come together as not just thankful refugees from sorrow, but wild, too, with easy days of mismatched socks. This morning, we think we couldn't be happier. That's courage. We thought it before. So my prompt to you guys is um, to think of um, objects, socks, shoes, light, tables, all the things in a life and um, think of them in relation to the sentence, uh, when you left, what I started to think about was. So, when you left, what I started to think about was. Thanks. Our final, final reader today will be Jonathan Wells, whose poems have appeared in The New Yorker, Poetry International, Hayden's Ferry, and other publications. 
He's the author of Train Dance from Four Way Books and edited Third Rail, the poetry of rock and roll from MTV Books, which was published in 2007. He lives and works in New York City. Please welcome Jonathan Wells. Hello, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to read a couple of poems from uh, Train Dance. Um, although I didn't really think of it as a book of love poems in any conventional or unconventional sense. Um, so I may have to read a couple which aren't in the book just because that's what the situation demands. Um, this is called London Plain, and it's not a plane to London, it's a tree, um, So, which will become very clear. London Plain. When I'm alone, the tree I love whispers and calls to me, indifferent to the season. I come to her in spring when she's in bud and winter when she's naked, only one side warm. In fall, she forgets herself and dreams. I come to her for learning and read her bark like braille. Her arms are twisted, lifted for attention, glassed in rain, or wrapped in mist, or gray. She speaks from her own wisdom, not always prompted by the wind. I come without ideas of love, for she is already rough and rounded, cankered, tall, and we are not alone. Finches listen from her branches and plastic bags luff, confiding my desires in the wind. The tree I love lowers me from my window ledge equal to her height. She says, sit close to me. When I call to you, what loneliness makes you listen? The next poem is untitled, which is its title. You taught me the river, its slender hands, fugitive smile, and phosphorescence. The river became my blood, my voice. Some mornings when the earth smells of earthworms and mist, a guitar will steal the river's chords from the underneath of leaves. A violin will take its deeper wood, the cat gut strings its notes. We walk the river, rock to rock. The river shape a fossil snake in a million miles of rock. The ears, the mouth, the neck, the bitten palm of rock, watch it go. Oh, never let me go. Um, as you'll see from my prompt, um, um, I think I specialize in indirectness. And uh, so this is a, a poem <coughs> called Squirrel Watching. The leash is taut. Her doleful eyes transfixed as she lifts her snout to heaven, every imaginable taste almost in her mouth. Tickling tail boa, crunchy bones and haunch. The squirrel freezes his body, spread eagled on the bark, terrified alert, condescending to a love that smells so much like blood. Each feature is profound. Wide black eyes stunned open, mini paws circling a nut in a blur, a dash of rust splashed on his back, peaky ears and a white throat scarf. Her love is the devouring of the whole in parts. She waits measuring his speed against her strike and leaps believing it was true. But if it were, the world would be bare of squirrels that looked away. Um, and since my poems are short, I, I guess um, uh, 
Uh, got time for one or two more. Um, this is called The Second Book of Love. He read aloud to her from the second book of love and all the other books. She listened without listening, as if it were a mist that drifted through her. He read, not noticing she slept. He didn't know these words would one day shape his lips. The old feelings would slip away and disappear. The trees would shine in an amber light that the once fresh light had turned into. Some pages would be as bright as sunspots on the surface. Others would be torn or torched under a magnifying glass without remorse. Crossed out words could still be glimpsed. It was a work still circling, a story that lay open on the lectern of crowded rooms and distracted nights written by two unlinked hands. It was made from the five senses and the sense of hovering above the air. It was the book of hours, the strip of days. In its line was the confusion between what was unsayable and what can't be said. Um, last poem uh, that I'll read is um, we moved into a new district recently, which has a lot of uh, shops which sell wigs. So I always imagined which one I'd like. And um, so I actually never went into the wig shops and wrote the poem instead. House of Wigs. The sky was low. His head was a vase of sorrows he wanted to fill with blossoms. He stepped into the house of wigs. The sales lady said, try this one on. It's called the mind of fire. It turns ashes into flame. Prometheus was wearing it, they say, when he was punished by the gods for his compassion, and he barely felt the eagle's claws landing on his stomach. This one is known as the parable of spring for its rhythm and its pageant. The fresh grass and forsythia will carry you toward summer, your body lithe and unencumbered, your hunger fed by fields of daisies. I'm wearing love's crown, she said, because love shouldn't be a neon idol shining on a shelf. It must be worn and worn through, and not just the love you bring, but what you can accept, especially when the days are short and brooding. Go ahead, she said. Put it on. Stand next to the light. Um, so um, I guess when I was trying to think of a prompt um, and what might be helpful, I couldn't really I couldn't really think about what I do because I don't know what I do. Um, so, but based on what I've done, I tried to figure out what I do. And so what I think that would be helpful um, is to think about someone or something you love and think of something as specific, as particular as you can get about the person, a look, an expression, a gesture, and don't think about naming the emotion. Think about the thing, and then the emotion itself will come through it. And um, so that's not as specific a prompt as one could get, but that's the best I can do. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you.